The impact of racism has been damaging and long-lasting to the U.S. society. For more than 400 years, racism has influenced practices and policies that have led to unfair disadvantages for some racial and ethnic communities, while in turn providing advantages and sustained powers to others. Scientific racism. Um, have these beliefs ever truly been reconciled or have they been undone by the healthcare system to date? No, we've had a long history of these mythologies being presented as science. They're not science. As Dorothy Roberts pointed out so brilliantly, racism created race, not the yes. other way around. Right. The Tuskegee syphilis study, it's like the well-known that everyone kind of go to, even during this time of COVID, right? But this was not an anomaly. And what are the other key moments in history that you would highlight from medical apartheid? There are so many studies that far exceeded Tuskegee in their venality, and in their harms, in their mortality. Tuskegee is fr frankly as bad as it is, just a shadow. So how has the conversation on racism and health changed from the time that you wrote Medical Apartheid till now? It has changed dramatically. When I wrote Medical Apartheid, even writing about racial issues and health was difficult. Frankly, systemic racism was not even in, forget the vocabulary, the mindset of many people at that point. We're not talking about a few bad apples, so to speak. We're talking about a system that's profoundly flawed, has been from the beginning, and needs uh, amendation. Can you speak uh, more about the historical issues regarding consent? African Americans were not, it wasn't their health that was prized. It was their bodies and the work that could be extracted from them. We're in dire straits today in terms of informed consent. We're really in danger of losing it. And we need to be very vigilant on behalf of people who can't fight for themselves. Hello, I'm Dr. Vabren Watts, Director of Health Equity at Health Affairs. And I'm Dr. Letha Maybank, Chief Health Equity Officer for the American Medical Association and member of the Health Affairs Health Equity Advisory Committee. The impact of racism has been damaging and long-lasting to the U.S. society. For more than 400 years, racism has influenced practices and policies that have led to unfair disadvantages for some racial and ethnic communities, while in turn providing advantages and sustained powers to others. In April 2021, Drs. Rhea Boyd, Nancy Krieger, Fernando DeMaio, and myself published an op-ed in Health Affairs on Medicine's Privileged Gatekeepers. The article investigated how many times the word racism was published out of over 220,000 articles from 1990 to 2020 in the four leading medical journals. Only 0.5% included the word racism and 0.2% were empirical or original studies. Most of the articles were viewpoints and opinion pieces. This reality of not publishing research on racism demonstrates censorship and the lack of value for research on racism and its impacts. The really critical part is that peer-reviewed journals really provide the basis for evidence-based clinical guidelines and protocols. Failure to accurately mention the impact of racism on health fosters ignorance amongst health professionals and policymakers, which eventually negatively impacts our patients. So in February 2022, Health Affairs focuses on racism in health. The issue features peer-reviewed articles that define systemic and structural racism, explain how these forms of racism damage health, and propose how to dismantle racist systems and structures. The issue also dives into more specific topics such as the impact of structural racism on the employment of black women in the U.S. healthcare labor force, how racial bias among physicians creeps into what is communicated in electronic health records, and how experiences of racism impact reproductive health care use and experiences. Alongside this special issue, we thought it was important for health affairs to provide a historical context about the impact of racism on health. To help us do so, we invited writer and author of the award-winning book, Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Time to Present, Harriet A. Washington. Thank you so much for joining us, Ms. Washington. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. Oh, thank you. So, you know, nearly 15 years ago, and I remember buying Medical Apartheid myself, you published a Medical Apartheid. It provided like a full history of the mistreatment, exploitation, and abuse of black Americans in the medical establishment.
And in researching the book, just curious to know, what did you uncover about the history of anti-black racism in medicine and research? Well, I remember you as one of the first people asked me to come and speak about my book. <laughs> I remember that very well. And it's something I had actually been investigating since the 1970s when I was an undergraduate. I had spent a lot of time in the history of medicine section of the library um, reading the works and I got my first inkling that something was not right. Because in the recounting of how physicians went to not only um, American areas where they treated African Americans or experimented upon them, but also foreign countries, I saw they reeked of xenophobia. Mm -hmm. They reeked of exploitation, and there was a sense of entitlement mm -hmm. about appropriating the bodies and tissues of other people. Um, and that attitude was quite pervasive and unapologetic. And the other thing I noticed immediately was there was a blame the victim mentality. When they described the illnesses and limitations of African Americans, it was always appended to um, explanation of black people's inferior cognition mm -hmm. and their deformed bodies, inferior bodies. And so it was very clear to me that these attitudes had helped shape medicine from the beginning. And when I heard um, explanations that were widely accepted about African Americans, like the belief that African Americans had lower intelligence, I thought it sounds very much like what I had read in these old books. Mm -hmm and there was very little data. Mm. So I began amassing information before I became a writer. I wasn't sure what I would do with it, but I knew it was important. And as time went on and I get, became more sophisticated in terms of doing research, um, and also very importantly, this information was not that hard to collect. Mm. Mm. But I was able to collect it only because I had access to privileged sites. Uh, I was a, at Harvard School of Public Health I had the Countway Library there. Um, medical libraries are, even today, closed to people who are not affiliated with the institution. And so I had access to the information. And it was really, really important for me to showcase it and show people what had actually happened, what had actually been written about, because I knew that I was looking at a history of medicine in the textbooks that was carefully curated right. to elide the experience of African Americans and to blame them for their own condition. So, so you talked about in the book, and we just talked, you just uh, brushed on it just now about how myths about genetic differences and about how cultural differences have weaponized, um, have, have been weaponized to justify poor, poor treatment for um, Black Americans. This is often described as scientific racism. Um, have these beliefs ever truly been reconciled, or and or have they been undone by the healthcare system to date? Yeah. No, they have not been effectively. Uh, refuted. Some people have done very good work in analyzing them. Um, in fact, many brilliant scholars, Stephen Jay Gould, The Mismeasure of Man, mm -hmm. uh, Robert Guthrie, lesser known but equally important, wrote a book about psychology and African Americans' history. The title, I love the title, Even the Rat Was White. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and we have contemporary books like Measured Lies, but these are not the books that people um, involved in discussions, when we exactly. hear about the bell curve, right. mm -hmm. a profoundly flawed work of propaganda, mm -hmm. which is heavily reliant on the fact that people are intimidated by numbers. Mm -hmm. So we've had a long history of these mythologies being presented as science. They're not science. We have to under remember that the hereditarians, scientists who insist that African American intelligence is lower and that that genetic is genetically mediated, these men are scientists, but they're something else. They also have strong political agenda. Every one of them has a political policy they're trying to promulgate based on their theories of inferiority. Some of them are not even very good geneticists, quite frankly. And um, it's important to remember that they're also something else in common. They're funded by the Pioneer Fund, an unapologetically eugenic racist group whose stated goal is the preservation of white civilization. Hmm. So we call them scientists, but they're not really scientists. Right. They're politicians, and they have a, a radical ideology. They have successfully been able to cloak with a thin veneer of science. Hmm. I think when you look at genetics as a mediator of alleged inferiority, we have to remember that this belief preceded 
scientific um, data used to support exactly. it. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, as Dorothy Roberts pointed out so brilliantly, um, racism created race, not yes. the other way around. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. So switching just a, a little bit, but all related, of course, um, the Tuskegee syphilis study um, in which researchers observed the toll of untreated syphilis on black men despite the availability of safe treatments at that time and despite telling them they were being treated is among the most, it's like the well-known that everyone kind of go to, even during this time of COVID, right? Everyone yes. kind of goes to the, the Tuskegee study or syphilis study and, and, it, and that's not even the proper way to say it either, the U.S. Public Health Service study, exactly. right? Um, but um, it's among the most well-known abuses of black bodies by medical established in the U.S. government. And it's often used as an example raised when discussing historic distrust among black Americans. But this was not an anomaly. And what are the other key moments in history that you would highlight from medical apartheid? Tuskegee is l more than, an, um, it's more than typical. It actually is an overburdened icon. Mm -hmm. We have actually yeah. projected on that one study, right. which is relatively, when you read my book, it's relatively benign. Mm -hmm. At the same time men were um, dying from syphilis through neglect in Tuskegee, we had black men and black women being killed outright by being infected with mm -hmm. um, malaria, falciparum malaria, the most deadly type. Um, but there are so many studies that far exceeded Tuskegee in their venality and in their harms, in their mortality. Tuskegee is fr frankly, as bad as it is, just a shadow. Um, I could point to the use of surgical technology, mm. often practiced on African American when whites would benefit from it. Mm. Eugenic research into re reproduction, using um, reproductive science to commit Frankly, genocide, it does conform to the UN definition of genocide, reducing births within a group. And so um, you also had the appropriation of African-American bodies in a wide number of venues. Everything from, we know about Henry Lack's cells being taken. I'm very happy that her, her name is now a household role that was unknown when I wrote the book. But um, it's common. What happened to Henrietta Lacks happened during colonial times mm -hmm. when doctors would take body parts from black people, everything from teeth to organs, and either experiment on them or transplant them elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but they actually dug up African-American bodies, cadavers from graveyards, used them for anatomical dissection. Preferentially, they didn't want to use white bodies, they used black bodies. And so that intent of entitlement persists today. You also had wielding of genetics in order to um, try to have a very, um, how can I put it, a very fragile, tenuous um, base for African Americans. So we had so many of these um, consistent policies that justified taking African American bodies, harming them, or even killing them, and then blaming them up for their own diseases, for their own condition. We also had outrageous uh, abuses of data. Mm. One of the things in my book that really surprised me was how illogical a lot of the research oh. conducted. Mm -hmm. The since 1840, the census by the U.S. Uh, government found that African Americans who were free were 11 times more likely than African Americans who were enslaved to be mentally ill. Oh, wow. And their conclusion was, oh, freedom is dangerous yes. to black people. Mm -hmm. You know, black people will lose their minds when they have to fend. They need enslavement. They need white people to care for them. That might not sound like a bloody um, scandal, but the reality is that belief was very persistent and it harmed many African-American people. Yes. Harms them still today, mm -hmm. the mentality that we aren't ca able to care for ourselves. So there's so much. <laughs> Tuskegee fades, you know, into the background, frankly. Can, this, and also just building on that, because, you know, I'm now at the American Medical Association and Jane Marion Sims, you know, I think you yeah. elevated mm -hmm that history to many people. Um, and he was a former president of the American Medical yes. Association mm -hmm. and that history of, you know, tied to reproductive justice, but also to support capitalism, mm -hmm. right? And, and it, it's really it was the preservation of, as one of my friends says, Dr. Joya Career Perry, um, how the, the black woman's womb was really kind of the engine mm 
of capitalism. And so it was, it was a need and a desire for somebody like a surgeon or a OBGYN to find an innovation that would preserve the womb in order to have reproduction happen. And so I think, you know, that's how, that's how I kind of think about mm -hmm. the context of J. Marion Sims. But can you just speak to that? Because you and I were there together when his statue was removed um, in Central Park yes. a few years ago. A beautiful day, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Um, several things are going on here. Dr. Sims abused black men and children as well, as I write mm -hmm. in my book. Mm -hmm. So he didn't only focus on women. Mm -hmm. But you're right. In my view, the reproductive, um, the fertility of black women is another form of work. And it highlights something really important that I state early in the book, and that was that we think of health and medicine as benefiting the patient, of the physician-patient diet, a beautiful relationship. It had nothing to do with African Americans and their doctors. Mm -hmm. It was not preserving um, their health, but preserving their ability to work that was important. Mm -hmm. And reproductive work was a kind of work. Thomas Jefferson said, I consider a woman who gives, a uh, slave woman who gives birth every two years as profitably as a best worker on the farm. Mm -hmm. Wow. So this work was really important and it was um, appropriated without any regard to ethics or even the touted Victorian adoration of the woman didn't apply to black women. Um, so that changed abruptly with freedom when suddenly uh, black women's alleged hyperfertility was no longer a commercial advantage for the owner, but a liability. Right. So at that point, black women, instead of being lauded for having many children, having them often, whether they wanted to or not, suddenly they're being blamed and castigated for the same thing. Mm -hmm. you know? So um, it's really important to see how the engine of medical theories and medical mythologies has driven, driven policies that affect people politically and affect their lives, out, even outside medicine. Absolutely. Interesting. You know, one of the um, theme, themes um, throughout your book and in your work today is about um, informed consent or, you know, lack of consent. Um, can you speak uh, more about the historical issues regarding consent and how that, that may pers um, uh, persist to this day? Oh, happily, <laughs> yes. <laughs> My latest book, Carte Blanche, mm -hmm. is about informed consent and how it is quickly fading from the American medical landscape with insufficient attention, in my opinion. But you can see evidence for this among African Americans from the advent to the, this country because there was no informed consent in the 17th century. Nobody had that. Right. But you did have simple consent where you had to get a yes or no. If you wanted to do an operation, if you wanted to use him for experimental purposes, you had to ask the permission of a white man. Yeah. Um, but with an African American, nobody asked your permission. Only permission that was needed was the permission of the owner. And if you did something to an African American without permission and the African American were killed or harmed, guess who was compensated? Mm -hmm. The owner. Oh. Um, it harkens back to this idea that African Americans were not, it wasn't their health that was prized. It was their bodies and the work that could be extracted from them. And so their lack of consent was, non, was, you know, was nothing. It was a non-entity. They had no legal protection. They were legally invisible and no recourse if they were forced into experimentation and killed or harmed. So fast forward after alleged emancipation, right? which we know is only in name only in many places. So you would think that at that point, doctors would begin seeing African Americans as worthy of the same consent. No, the same mentality persisted. In fact, in the North and after emancipation, black people who were fortunate enough to find a place in the hospital when they needed care, not at all guaranteed, they were forced to go to charity wards and these were rat infested, filthy, places, and they also were forced to undergo research mm -hmm. as payment mm -hmm. for being treated in the charity ward. So there still was no consent. Mm -hmm. And today, when we, you know, we boast of this matrix of protection to Code of Federal Re Regulation ensures that every person uh, has a right to informed consent, having a doctor explain in great detail everything that they need to know to make a good decision. And that's on paper, but 
it's been chipped away at consistently. For African Americans, it was always chimerical, just blatantly ignored many times. But in 1990s, we actually began passing laws saying that if you're a trauma victim, no one, you can do research without getting the person's permission. Oh. Not just informed consent, you can bypass consent at all. And we have tested artificial blood using that. I went, I did a, I did a story which Harper's professed to like, but then refused to publish, where I looked at artificial blood. Where is it being tested without getting people's permission? There are, most these cities had more black people than white people. And even cities that were not, like LA, we, they found that the neighborhoods that were used were black and Hispanic neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So African Americans are bearing the brunt of the evasion of informed consent. And my big fear is that, I wrote this book because my fear is that one day we're gonna wake up and find that it's gone. Mm -hmm. It's happening insidiously without much fanfare. When doctors talk about it among themselves, these coded words like EFIC, exception from informed consent, right? Mm -hmm. A lay person has no idea what that is, Correct. which is why they use the terminology. Mm -hmm. So we're in dire straits today in terms of informed consent. We're really in danger of losing it. And we need to be very vigilant on behalf of people who can't fight for themselves. Um, in, a, in an earlier uh, conversation, you, you did talk about, you know, that um, that means a look to institutions to actually restore or build trust among the um, black American population. Are there any um, situations in where black people are being blamed for this medical mistrust? Yes, the very focus on mistrust in the African American community implies that there's something pathological about the way African Americans are thinking or behaving. And unfortunately, it takes the um, focus away from the real issue, which is the system. We have a healthcare system which is repeatedly and consistently shown it can't be trusted, it's not trustworthy. And so in order to regain trust, or regain is a wrong verb because it never gained in the first place, but mm -hmm. in order to instill trust, be trustworthy. We need to redouble our efforts and focus on crafting a healthcare system that is devoid of the errors and biases and the um, basically the abuses of the past and present. And if we do that, I think we'll find that people will flock to it and we'll no longer have to address any question of mistrust. Absolutely, and I would imagine, you know, during this time of COVID, there are examples um, in which, you know, black folks and probably other folks of color have experienced, but especially black men um, in walking into institutions and trying to walk into institutions and having experiences. Have you heard of any of those? Exactly. Um, I'm thinking in particular of black men who have both been ejected from banks and stores by security guards and police who say they look like criminals wearing their mask and barred entry or accosted by police for not wearing a mask. In New York City, on the same day, you had police officers smiling and handing out masks to white people who didn't have one, while they um, harassed and threatened with arrest African Americans who were not wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. And so um, this blame the victim mentality is so pervasive, but that's only one example of it. Other examples include things like even healthcare professionals you know, exhorting African Americans to um, observe so social distancing. Well, the Surgeon General said that, but he must have known that a good 40% of the people who are essential workers can't practice social distancing. They can't avoid riding or driving the subway. They can't avoid contact with the public in their jobs in restaurants or cleaning hospitals, you know? So exhorting them to um, behave in a way that you know they can't behave is abusive. Also, you know, mass transit, another good example. If you live in a crowded tenement in New York City, you cannot social distance. You can't avoid sharing the hallways and elevators. And yet, I remember seeing a legislator in New York City writing, um, writing potential policy saying that pe um, risks are partly dictated by where people choose to live. I wrote back, Nobody chooses to live right. in a tenement in Harlem. Correct. You know, people are forced there by policies like redlining and um, other types of mortgage exclusion. So we have to acknowledge that our system is putting people at risk and not blaming them for risks that they can't control. Absolutely, and you're mentioning kind of the heaviness of what structural racism is. Mm -hmm. This 
reinforcing these mutual systems, reinforcing themselves that carry burden and harm onto people. Exactly. We're talking today in the context of Health Affairs releasing its first ever journal issue on racism and health. Big deal. Yes. So how has the conversation on racism and health changed from the time that you wrote A Medical Apartheid till now? It has changed dramatically. It's hard to mis overstate how much it's changed. When I wrote Medical Apartheid, even writing about racial issues in health was difficult because there was a lot of sensitivity, uh, a lot of euphemisms tend to be used, and also a lot of episodic treatments. Every abuse, every outrage, every crime that was reported was treated like um, an individual event. You know, a lot of um, isolated treatment, very little appreciation for a context or a systemic mm -hmm. problem. More um, a matter of indicting or possibly exonerating um, a wrongdoer who's held to be solitary, who had made a single mistake. Um, and there, frankly, systemic racism was not even in, forget the vocabulary, the mindset of many people at that point. And also a lot of defensive reactions. If, you, if I wrote about a me, uh, an abuse in medicine, many people took it as a personal affront, um, quickly you know, claiming, I'm not racist, my colleagues aren't racist, and how dare you say this? A very different climate from today when people exhibit a lot more openness and um, not only acknowledge that there's a problem, but thanks to the work, like your, uh, people of yourself, um, they understand that it's a systemic problem something that we're not talking about a few bad apples, so to speak. We're talking about a system that's profoundly flawed, has been from the beginning, and needs uh, amendation. So I think we've come very far. We have very far to go, but we've come very far. Thanks for watching. To learn more, make sure you check out the entire health affairs issue dedicated to racism and health at healthaffairs.org. If you enjoyed this video or even learned something new, please share with a friend or colleague. This video is only the beginning. Read our full issue of peer-reviewed research dedicated to the topic of racism and health. The February 2022 issue features articles that define systemic and structural racism, explain how these forms of racism damage health, and propose how to dismantle racist systems and structures. The issue will delve into more specific topics such as the impact of structural racism on the employment of black women in the U.S. healthcare labor force, how racial bias among physicians creeps into what is communicated in electronic health records, and how experiences of racism impact reproductive care use and experiences. Thank you to the funders who made this issue of health affairs on racism and health possible. This includes the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the California Wellness Foundation, the Episcopal Health Foundation, the Kellogg Foundation, and the NYS Health Foundation. Alongside this video and peer-reviewed research, we have a series of podcasts, free virtual events, and Forefront articles. Find this and more at healthaffairs.org.